Live with, brought to you by SciTech Nutrition. Visit SciTechNutrition.com. I'm your host, Dave Palumbo, tonight, and it is my distinguished honor to invite our guest of the evening, Mr. 5% himself, the freak of freaks, Rich Piana. Welcome. What's up? What's up, Dave? How you doing? What's up, Rich? Uh, what's with the beard? Great. I like the new beard. <laughs> Thanks, man. Except I can't see you. There you go. Laziness. <laughs> it's not it's a st- just laziness. Just too fucking busy to shave, honestly. But you always have some new fashion statement. I, I, I and I've told you this before. I like your hair dark like that. I think it looks great. That's the best way it looks. Sometimes you make it white and you do some crazy stuff. But you always seem to be changing up your styles a lot. Is that purposely done to keep the uh, the fans on their toes, or do you just get bored? You know, I, I've always been that way. You know, even back in my high school days, I've always just mixed it up and different hairstyles. And, you know, yeah, I've, I've always been that way. Now, you had I, your I, hair- can't, I can't explain the reasoning, but yeah, I've always uh, just always changing my hair and doing different shit. And, you know, and plus, it's funny to listen to the fans, you know, everyone's two cents on, you know, how I look. And <laughs> it seems like. I look better the other way, no matter how I am. <laughs> no matter no matter what I look like, I always look better the other way. <laughs> so you, you you think the fans always like you, however you don't look, essentially. Exactly. No matter yeah, no matter how it, how I look, it's always better the other way. <laughs> I'm never. It's never right. Right? Well, Isn't that the truth? So we always want what we can't have. Also, now you're you're an enigma in our sport. I mean, you're just like the perfect definition of someone who shouldn't succeed but did succeed and succeed beyond anyone's expectations. I mean, your companies are doing great. Um, you have a uh, everyone knows who you are. Your household name. You probably get the most hits on any of your YouTube videos that you put up there of anyone out there in our industry. Uh, it, it, it's incredible, you know, when I think about, you know, what you've built for yourself. But a lot of people don't know where Rich Piana came from. And, you know, some of the, one of the things I love to do with live with is kind of take a step back for a minute. Let's go back to your humble beginnings. First of all, how did you get involved with bodybuilding? What, at what point in your life did you say, you know what, this is something I love to do? Uh, well, my, my mom was a competitive bodybuilder, so I was raised in Gold's Gym, and so, you know, she was, she was single at the time, and I was, you know, five, six years old, so, you know, she was, she dated, you know, bodybuilders, so I was always around bodybuilders, and then, you know, she'd take me to the gym, so I was at the gym while she trained, you know, six, seven years old, um, you know, just in the environment, so... It was kind of, you know, like basically this is what I was going to be, you know, I mean, it was pretty much being in the gym every single day as a six, seven year old, you know, that's just, that's where I was headed and, you know, watching the big guys and, you know, I was into the He-Man action figures, you know, and then I look around and realize that there's actually, you know, real cartoon characters like this and, you know, so I just became intrigued as a little kid and, uh, you know, watching um, you know, the interaction and, you know, how people treated the bigger guys in the gym and, you know, how the, the women seem to be more attracted to the bigger guys. I think that was all implanted in my head as a little kid. So, you know, that's, that's, that's the way I went. You know, I don't think that would have, it, it could have been any other way, you know, just being involved in that at such an early age. At what point did you say to yourself, you know what, I want to start competing? I mean, when did it get to the point of seriousness where you said, you know what, not only do I want to be big because I want attention, but I actually want to get up on stage and compete like my mom did. Yeah, you know, it was, I started training serious. I mean, I started lifting weights at 11 and I started training seriously, you know, just like, you know, twice a day, you know, trying to eat the right foods at age 13. And so I stepped on stage at age 15 for the first time. And what happened is um, the coach, the high school football coach at school, they were having a, a high school, you know, bodybuilding contest and they wanted, you know, the coach to pick, you know, the best, uh, what he would think would be the best person at each school to compete in this bodybuilding contest. So, you know, the coach picked me and, you know, I ended up going and competing and I got fourth place out of, you know, a lot of guys. I'd say there was probably, you know, 20 something kids. And, uh, you know, that was it after that. I was, you know, I was hooked. And I think that's the same with everyone. You know, the first time you get a taste of that stage, that's it, right? <laughs> you're, you're hooked. Did your, uh, was your mom a good bodybuilder? I don't know who she was. Would we know who she is? Who we are? Who she oh, was? You know, she, um, she won the Golden Bear 
which was a, a big show they had at the state fair, you know, in Sacramento every year. It was, a, it was, you know, it was on the news and they put it in the newspaper. So it was, it was a pretty good publicized, you know, considered a big show at the time. Um, she won that contest, the overall, and then she went in the California state and um, she won her class. And, uh, you know, at the time, as you know, the, the California state, you know, back 25 years, 20, 25 years ago, or maybe 30 years ago, you know, was a huge show at the time. And um, so she won her class and she was going to compete on the national level, but, you know, never ended up going any further than that. You know, that was that was where, you know, it was basically, you know, a question of, you know, taking the drugs, you know, at that point, you know, back in those days, that was, you know, when Pump and Iron 2 came out was when she was competing. So, so you know, the, the, the bodybuilding girls were like the bikini girls are nowadays. You know, the only, you know, Bev Francis was the freak, you know, and Rachel McLeish, you know, was, you know, everyone strived to be like her. And if you see pictures of her now, to me, she looks like a bikini girl. Did you ever get to meet Rachel back in the day and some of the girls, you know, that were competing at that uh, elite level in the beginning? Uh, you know, I, I never did. I mean, I met, I remember as a kid, I met Lou Ferrigno. Um, I met, you know, I met a couple here and there, but, um, you know, not any, you know, not very many at all. Um, I was in, I was in Sacramento. And so, you know, it was, uh, um, you know, a much smaller town and bodybuilding wasn't as big as, you know, when I moved to Los Angeles. Do you remember the first time you went into Gold's Gym Venice? Uh, how old were you? And, and what was the, the, the most vivid memory of that? Uh, I was 18 years old, I believe. And, you know, that was back in the day when, you know, you walk in the gym and there's, there's 20 pros there, you know, at any given time. And uh, it, it was pretty, it was pretty amazing. I mean, it was, it was amazing. I mean, back in those days, it was, you know, Bible was totally different. And, uh, you know, it, it, I just remember just being in awe, you know, and um, it, it's so different nowadays than it was back then. You know, the, there were, people were so much more respectful of the pros than they were, they were looked upon, I believe as, you know, like celebrities, you know, huge, huge celebrities. And I remember, you know, just seeing these guys in person and just be like, holy fuck, that's so-and-so. Oh my God, that's so-and-so. You know, it was, for me, it was a real big deal, you know, to actually see, you know, to see these people in person. When you go into the gym now, when you show up at Gold's Gym Venice, and I'm sure there's plenty of people that recognize you and come up to you, how does it feel like to be that, now to be that guy that's the celebrity in the gym that people are recognizing and coming up to and wanting pictures with, et cetera, et cetera? It, it still boggles my mind, to be honest with you. You know, I mean, the, the, way, the way my career happened as far as bodybuilding is, is, is just crazy, as you know. I mean... You know, I, I, I was, you know, killing myself, you know, to be a top bodybuilder, you know, back in the day, along with you, you know, we competed together and, you know, I was doing everything possible, you know, to be a bodybuilder, everything, you know, I would have fucking gave my right arm to have a sponsor, you know, back then. And, you know, it, it you know, it wasn't, it wasn't happening, you know, and, um, you know, and then I got completely out of bodybuilding, you know, had nothing to do with bodybuilding at all. And then next thing you know, I'm. <laughs> I'm I'm thrown into it, you know, and then next thing you know, I'm, I'm you know somewhat of a celebrity, not competing, you know, not wanting to compete. So it just happened completely backwards. Explain to me what happened from the guy who wanted to be on stage and and loved competing to the guy who didn't want to be on stage, but yet didn't leave the sport and somehow backdoored himself into the sport as the biggest freak out there. Give me that the, the dynamic of how that whole happened, the, the synthesis of it. Um, the, the thing was, is a lot of people, a lot of people don't realize, you know, what we put into those shows. You know, I mean, we, we give our life, you know, to those contests, you know, getting ready for the USA's, you know, I, I know you were there right next to me and, you know, it's, we, we give everything possible, you know, that, that day means the world to us, you know, and, you know, I, I every single minute of every single day, you know, for a year straight, you know, I live, you know, to, to win that trophy, you know, starting a year out. And I thought about that trophy, you know, every minute of the day, you know, and everything I did every minute of the day had to do with winning that trophy. You know, that was all that was on my mind. So, I mean, I gave everything. I gave, you know, everything I could possibly give. And, you know, I think that 
giving so much, you know, and eventually learning that I was really getting, you know, really nothing in return. You know, it just kind of opened my eyes. And um, I think everyone's aware of what I'm saying, but, you know, I have to say that for me, you know, I, I would call it an addiction because, you know, I knew that it wasn't the best scenario for me. It wasn't the best choice for my life. You know, it wasn't, um, but it was something that I just couldn't give up. You know, I had to keep going. And um, it was just an obsession, you know, an addiction of, you know, just having, you know, to, to turn pro, you know, to be a top pro, to live my life as a bodybuilder. It was something that, you know, I couldn't stop doing. And there were so many times that I would quit, you know, retire, I'm done, you know, and that would last, what, a week? <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, I, I know there's so many people out there right now that can relate with me, you know, that have been there or could be there right now. And it's just frustrating you know, to give so much, you know, and really not get much in return. And, you know, I, I think that I, my eyes finally opened and, um, you know, it was, it was, I think becoming successful in other things is what helped open my eyes and realize that, you know, there's other things out there that, you know, I can, I can get a lot more out of that, you know, putting my, my interests and, you know, my energy towards these other things in life. I get a lot more in return. What were some of your other things that you did that you, you, you made money? Because obviously you were very successful financially outside of bodybuilding. How did that happen? What, what were some of these uh, other avenues you uh, intercalated yourself into? Um, well, I was, I was introduced to mutual funds in my early 20s. And so I started putting money away. And then, you know, from there I started to learn about what makes up a mutual fund, you know, stocks. And then I started learning about trading stocks and, you know, became interested in I started day trading and started, you know, making money doing that at home. And, you know, originally um, I was putting money in my mutual fund to get a new, you know, cool ass car, you know, typical, you know, mindset of a 20 year old. Right. <laughs> so but as the money grew, I realized, well, fuck, you know, I can I can actually put a down payment on a house. And, you know, that's about the time when the you know, what was the book, the rich dad, poor dad or, you know, the book everyone's read. So that's about the time that book came out and someone talked me into reading that book. And, you know, that's, that's when my mind just started going and thinking about, you know, real estate and making money and retirement. And I was still day trading, making money doing that. And I bought my first house at 20, 23 years old. And that was when the market was just going crazy. So the stock market was going crazy. The real estate market was going crazy. So I was, you know, I was making money day trading and, you know, my house, the equity just went through the roof in two years. So I ended up, um, you know, selling that house, buying a better house. And, you know, then after reading that book, I followed, you know, what the book said. And I pulled all my equity out of the house and I bought property in Texas. So I basically just started seeing, you know, how easy it was, you know, to, to be successful and make money. And the thing is, is back in those days, it was really, really easy to make money both real estate, you know, and the stock market. I mean, it's now forget about it, you know, forget about it. There's, you're not going to make any money in either one of those things. But, you know, back then it was, it was a no brainer, you know, it's just, you know, both, both markets were flying. So that's, that's what kind of helped pull me away is realizing how much I was getting out of putting my energy towards these things, you know, and then I would do a contest and, you know, throw away 10 grand, you know, and walk away if I was lucky with a trophy, you know. Right. When did you decide to create the image of Rich Piano, Mr. 5%? At what point did that happen? I, I don't even know when it happened. It kind of just, you all of a sudden just showed up again, and I saw this big, freaky, tattooed guy, uh, and you were the Rich Piano we know today. What year would you say that started? Uh, well, that, that was probably, that was about two years ago, two, two and a half years ago. I mean, the first step back into bodybuilding was with Mutant. And, uh, you know, that was, they're a supplement company and they got a hold of me and wanted to sponsor me, you know, as an athlete. And I wasn't competing and I wasn't even involved in the bodybuilding world whatsoever. I was completely out of the bodybuilding world, 100%. Had no, you know, no interest whatsoever. And, you know, they started talking to me and, you know, what they were telling me was, you know, was, was pretty you know, pretty enticing, you know, they wanted to put me at boost, they wanted to do a video series, 
you know, making me the star of the series. And, you know, it was just out of nowhere, you know, um, it, it just seemed like fun, you know. It's, honestly, it seemed like fun and something I never got to do when I was a bodybuilder competing. So I, I ended up uh, signing a contract with them and, and moving forward. And, you know, within like overnight, you know, I just blew up. And, uh, you know, it was pretty crazy. We did YouTube series. And I, you know, back then, you know, two, two and a half years ago, you know, there wasn't a lot of good videos, you know, on YouTube. You know, now there's, you know, tons, you know, so the YouTube, becoming successful on YouTube is a lot harder now than it was, you know, two, two and a half years ago. So those videos that we did were, you know, were amazing, you know, compared to the other, other, other things happening on YouTube. You know, they were really ahead of their time as far as production value and, you know, everything else. So, you know, that, that's what it was. And, um, so that's what, that's what got me back into the bodybuilding world. And, um, you know, and then from there, I just decided to, uh, you know, why not do my own supplement company? You know, it was, uh, I saw, you know, how I was, you know, making this company grow like crazy, you know, why not do that for myself? Right. And, uh, plus I, you know, I've, as being a bodybuilder my whole life, I've always had, you know, great ideas and, you know, things I've wanted to do. You know, we, we all have that, you know, we, we are, our dream days of dreaming of someday opening the gym or some days having a supplement line. And, you know, so that's something I think, you know, every bodybuilder out there would, would like to do someday, you know, because it's something we enjoy. And, uh, so yeah, that's, 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 that's how that all got started. Talk to me about the tattoos, uh, Rich, because, you know, bodybuilders have t cool tattoos, but a lot of them don't go crazy and put them everywhere. I mean, you have them everywhere now. They just they keep growing and growing, and I know you're, like, obsessed with them, probably the way you were with bodybuilding when it first started. Where did this whole love for tattoos come from? Uh, well, the truth is, is I always I always had an interest in tattoos as as a kid, and um, there, was, there was particular people that were involved in my life at an early age that – had tattoos, and I think that was how they kind of grew on me. Is um, you know, is is from seeing certain people that you know played a part of my life that that had tattoos, so that interests me and me wanting to be like them. You know, as a little kid looking up to them as a mentor, you know, that made me in my head, you know, want to be like them and have a tattoo someday. You know, as a little kid, and so that started it. And the the crazy thing is, is I started getting tattoos while I was competing. And what I was doing is I was getting them done in bronze. So I would bring, um, I, I was, I was, I used to use Dream Tan when I competed, which that was a big no-no in the MPC. You know, Dream Tan was just, you know, you cannot use it. You're going to get scored down. And the way it made me look, you know, like a bronze statue, and it just makes you stand out on stage. That I, I just continued to use it. I just, I loved, you know, the, the appearance. And Muhammad was a very good friend of mine, and. You know, I was just like, fuck it, I'm going to keep using Dream Tan, you know, and the judges told me personally, they're like, if you use Dream Tan, we're going to fucking mark you down, you know, and I'm like, fuck it, I look better with Dream Tan. My whole goal is to look the best on stage, so I said, fuck it, mark me down, you know, and as long as I look my best, you know, that's that's what I'm trying to accomplish. So um, I actually took the Dream Tan into tattoo studios, and I would have them make the exact same color as Dream Tan. And then I got tattoos. So when I put the dream tan on, you couldn't see my tattoos on stage. So it was actually, it was actually pretty cool. It was different. And it was kind of the same as, you know, when you see a black guy with, with tattoos, you know, it looks like a sh shadowy. And uh, so that's what it looked like. And so I had that for probably three or four years uh, while I was still competing. And, uh, and then eventually I just went ahead and, you know, got them done in black. And then that was it. You know, after that, it was like, you know, it's, it's done. You know, once you get those black tattoos, you know, your your body back then your bodybuilding days were over. You know, now now it's acceptable. Now it's you know it's everyone has tattoos. How far will you go with these tattoos? Will you ever like put them on your face, you think? No, I mean I, I think I'm pretty much done. I mean, I don't really have too many areas left. There isn't any areas that I really would want to tattoo at this point. And I definitely would never go, you know, I wouldn't go on my face or my neck. You know, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I think what I've done now is, is you know, a, a little crazy as it is. I don't think I'd go any further. And I'm kind of over it, you know. Um, I am, you know, it's, it's, everyone has a tattoo now, you know, so it's kind of not the same. 
So I'm, I'm kind of over the whole tattoo thing. Gotcha. But, you know, I, I definitely don't have any tattoos I regret. You know, there's nothing that I'm like, oh, I don't know why I did this. You know, I'm happy with everything. So that's all good. Um, I, Rich, are you amazed at the popularity that you have, given the fact, let's, let's go back to the late 90s, early 2000s, when we look at Greg Valentino, uh, he had the crazy freaky arms, and, and, and he was kind of like the, the rich piano of that era, and he was kind of looked at as, as a pariah almost, people like made fun of him almost, they, they thought he was funny, but he wasn't really taken seriously, nowadays, though, now in the year 2015, you know, 2016, you're like you're like a hero. It's almost like the it's almost like the I call it the anti-hero uh, era, where guys or kids are looking up to the guys that are the rebels almost, and they're not looking up to the to the Jay Cutlers anymore. The uh, the Rich Pianas are the are the freaks. The C T Fletchers, the uh, Cali Muscles. Why do you think that is now? Why do you think kids today are, are almost looking for the uh, the negative uh, hero, so to speak, as opposed to you know Superman? Uh, well, I mean. The way I see it is, I think the biggest reason for my popularity is my honesty. And, you know, I, I basically come out and just tell it how it is. And I think that's what started my popularity because, um, you know, it's, 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 you know, most, most of the bodybuilders out there, you know, they won't, they won't be honest with, you know, their drug use or, you know, different things. And so I think, I think that was what, I think that's what started my popularity is me coming out and just, you know, admitting that I take steroids. You know, I think that was, which to me isn't, I don't think that's a big deal, you know, but for whatever reason, I think that was, that was a big deal to the general public is, you know, someone actually coming out and saying, yeah, you know, I take steroids, you know, and this is what I do. And, you know, I've, I've tried everything and, you know, I've, I've done everything and, you know, just, just being honest about that, I think was the beginning. Um, and, you know, it's, if you watch any, if you watch my videos or follow me at all, you realize that, you know, I'm 100% positive. And, you know, for me, I'm just about motivating people and educating people. And my biggest mission is to educate people and, um, you know, teach people the things I feel they need to know that, that, you know, I wasn't taught, you know, going through the bodybuilding industry that I wish I was aware of, you know. And, you know, the biggest thing is the misconception that, you know, every single person out there has is, you know, how much money, you know, you make, you know, being a bodybuilder. And, you know, I think a lot of people wouldn't choose that road if they knew the reality, you know, so that's been one of my biggest missions is get it out there and letting people know, you know, um, the road they're choosing, you know, because what happens is a lot of times when you find out the reality of the sport, you're, you're already 10, 15 years deep, you've already dedicated you know, most of your life, and it's really hard to give it up at that point, um, you know, so I think, you know, letting people know, you know, the truth about the sport, and the politics, and the bullshit, and, you know, everything, um, you know, someone that's 16, 17 year old that, that's aiming to go in that direction, at least let them be aware of everything that they're getting themselves into, and then they can make the right choice, you know, rather than most of us, you know, we didn't learn these things until, you know, we were, you know, competing on the national level, you know, which we're not going to give it up at that point. We're so close to turning pro that, you know, how can you just walk away? You know, so that that's been important to me is is, you know, educating people on, you know, everything. Now, Rich, uh, speaking about steroid cycles, um, your latest steroid cycle that I don't know if you're still on or you're the one you, you, you were about to start or you started right before the holidays is like all over the place. I mean, if I have one more person ask me on Ask Dave or text me or email me, what do you think about Rich Piana's latest cycle? <laughs> I don't know what to tell them anymore. What What's going on with this latest cycle? And um, do, you, do you think, and, I, and I'm being honest here, that you know when you put these cycles out there, these especially the crazy ones, is it irresponsible? I know you want to be a role model and you want to try to tell you know keep kids safe and tell them the truth, but is it irresponsible in the sense that they're going to want to be like you and try to emulate you doing a cycle like this um the, yeah the the thing is is the whole reasoning for me doing the cycle is um people constantly assume that i'm obsessed with being as big as i can and i'm constantly you know trying to be as big as i can and doing everything i can i'm taking all the drugs in the world and i'm doing this and i'm doing that and the reality is is the last 15 years you know, I've eaten two or three meals a day, 
you know, my cycles have been very moderate, just kind of to maintain what I have. And, and, you know, people obviously aren't going to believe that. Um, so, you know, I figured, I said to myself, I said, you know what, I'm going to show these people that if I really wanted to get big, you know, that I can blow up and gain 30 pounds, you know, in a month. You know, it's not, it's, I'm not, I haven't been trying, you know, to be a big bodybuilder, you know, the last 15 years. And also when people come to the expo and they ask me about, you know, putting on size and getting big, people, they act like it's so difficult and it's so impossible. And, you know, I explain to them what they have to do. And it, it's, it's frustrating because to me, it, it's so simple. You know, it's so easy. As long as you're consistent and you somewhat know what you're doing, you know, it, it's, it's not that difficult to put on a lot of muscle, you know. And so I said, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to I'm just going to show people. You know, I'm going to do a YouTube series and I'm just going to show people how easy it is and they're going to visually see how easy it is. They're going to see me put on size daily. And also, it's going to show people that, I mean, I've constantly said that if I wanted to be, I could be 350 pounds, you know, without a problem. But I don't want to be that big, you know. That's why I, I like to stay around 260, you know, is, is, is the best weight for me. And so... Now, if I show people that in three months I can put on, you know, 40 or 50 pounds, um, then they'll realize that, you know, I haven't been trying to put size on. I haven't been doing crazy cycles, you know, that I have been doing exactly what I've been saying, you know, which is very moderate doses and just eating like a normal person, you know, and uh, just to maintain the size that I have. And, um, you know, 260 is the best weight for me. So, you know, I put on... Uh, maybe I put on 20, 29 pounds, you know, in the last, uh, it's been less than four weeks. It's been like maybe three and a half weeks. And, you know, we, me and you both know a lot of that is water, you know, but, um, as I, as I keep growing and I keep doing the cardio and, you know, it's slowly, you know, going to be completely muscle gain, you know, at the end of the four months. And, um, you know, and I don't, I, if I get to 330, 325, three, whatever it is, it's not somewhere I'm going to want to be. It's not somewhere I'm comfortable at. It's not, it's not the best scenario. It's not healthy. I'm aware of all these things. And, you know, I am going to go back, you know, to my desired weight, which is 260. But I think that I'm going to teach a lot of people and educate people and, and show people, you know, how easy it is to put on that size. And the people that, that are trying to be a professional bodybuilder, I can show them that it's, it doesn't take 10 years to put on that kind of size. You know, you can do it in, in a couple years, you know, if, if, if you go about it the right way. Do you think it's, it's sending the wrong message out to some of these younger kids, though, that they're going to want to try to do exactly what you did? And you and I both know when you're first starting out, you don't need to do as much as, as, as you know, drug-wise. You don't need to do the crazy, crazy stuff that you might have to do later in your career. Um, is it sending the wrong message to your followers? That's my question. No, because I, I've been very, I, I've been talking about steroids for, you know, four years and I've been very, very, very clear that the, the most important part of taking steroids is to get the most you can out of as little as possible. And that's, that's the main reason why people can't put on that much size is because they end up, they end up taking too much and there's nowhere to go from there, you know, and they plateau and then they're stuck and there's nowhere to go. And just put it on size, not even talking about, you know, health risk and so on and so forth. It's, it is better to get the most you can out of as little as possible. You know, it's just like someone that's never drank alcohol before. You know, if you decide you want to get a little buzz on a Friday night, you know, you can drink a beer and get a great buzz. Um, you know, there's, there's no reason to go take six shots of vodka. You know, it's overkill. And it's the same, you know, with steroid use. You want to get the most you can for as little as possible. And I explain to people that, that that's exactly – so in this steroid program, that's exactly what I'm doing. I start off at a, at a, at a very moderate dose, and I'm slowly adding, um, you know, adding to the, to the cycle. And, um, you know, that's – a lot of people – you know, we'll start off at a high dose or they'll just stay at a high dose. Or there's even 
people that believe in starting off with a high dose and then coming down. And, you know, that's the worst thing you could possibly do, you know, and, uh, you know, it's just throwing a bunch of drugs all at once. So um, I think the way I'm showing people to do it is a much safer way. And the cycle that I'm doing, yeah, when you get to the, towards the end of three or four months straight, it does become, you know, a pretty big cycle. But I'm very clear that, you know, that this is a cycle for a 300 pound bodybuilder that's been, you know, doing this for 28 years, you know, and Rich, what is the cycle up to now? What, what is, what is the crescendo dosages? Give us, give, I know there's people watching now who might not know what your, your cycle is. Give us the, the max dose dice of the, of the cycle. Start off with, start off with like 400 milligrams of test and, you know, 200 milligrams of DECA. That's, but that's me. That's what I'm starting off with. You know, people have to find, they have to, they're going to do what fits them compared to, in other words, someone that's 180 pounds, that's only done two cycles, is going to start with 100 milligrams of test and 50 milligrams of DECA. You know, which, uh, that's, that's per week. Okay. I Give us your max. I want to know what, what the rich piano – don't worry about what anyone else should be taking. What's the rich piano max dose per week? Uh, the, max, the max dose in this cycle is I'm taking three cc's of test and um, three cc's of trim blown and uh, 200, milligra uh, 200 milligrams of – I believe – Possibly 150 milligrams of anadrol. Right. Per day. Uh, three pills. I think it's three pills. I think it's 150 milligrams. Okay. So, I mean, that's the max is, uh, is three cc's, three cc's. And the thing is, is that, you know, you're taking three shots a week. And, I mean, I personally know people that take six, seven shots a day. I mean, I, I, I mean the thing is, is people are losing their minds over this cycle. And another thing that I've, I've you know, Real quick, you know, a theory that I threw at people that I think is, you know, an incredible help is, is that in order to keep getting results, you know, you have to up the dosage, you know, because the body gets used to the same amount. Well, an example is, let's say you're taking um, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you're taking test, equipoise, and trembolone, right? So you're taking one cc of test, once to see a trim blown, once to see a equipoise, three times a week. So I do that for three weeks straight, okay? So after three weeks, I feel the body gets used to those three compounds, gets used to that dose. Now, what I do is I switch, I completely switch that around, and now on Monday, I take three cc's of test, Wednesday, three cc's of trend, Friday, three cc's of equipoise. So what I'm doing is I'm completely changing the drug regimen and I'm going to shock the body into new growth, but I'm not up in the milligrams at all. Yeah. So what that is, is it's, it's showing people a safer way to, you know, to get results without having to up the milligrams. And, you know, doing something like that, you know, is a huge, you know, is, is a, to me, you know, is good, good information because the, the way the body reacts is incredible and you're taking the same amount of milligrams. So it's, it's a safer way to keep adding to the cycle, you know, without, you know, making it too harsh on the system. So it's just little tricks like that, you know, that I'm, I'm telling, I'm giving people you know, that is actually a safer way, you know, as far as, you know, cycling. Rich, the day after you take the three cc's of Trenbolone, which we know is very androgenic and can make you a little nutty, in addition to the 150 milligrams of Anadrol you're taking that day, uh, are you a little aggressive that day, to say the least? Yeah, I haven't got to that. I haven't got to that part of the cycle yet. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I definitely, it definitely... Um, you know, affects me tremendously, you know, my, my patients and, you know, uh, you know, it, it definitely become more aggressive, but I have much better control over it these days than I did, you know, 20, 20 years ago. That's for sure.
Now, do you notice that the Anadrol, so, such a high dosage, will kill your appetite and make it hard for you to eat? Because I always felt when I competed and took Anadrol, I, I, I had no appetite. Yeah, no, it does that to most people. It does. It, it's really hard on the stomach. And um, I don't have that problem, but I would say 80% of people out there do have that problem. And, you know, I, 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 use, I also use injectable Anadrol. Um, the thing is, is that I don't, I don't put things out there that people aren't going to be able to, you know, use, you know, because it just complicates things and it makes people, you know, oh, shit, I can't get that. Where am I going to get that? Uh, you know, so, you know, the truth be told is I'm not even, I'm, I'm not even using the oral. I'm using the injectable. But if I was to put injectable Anadrol, it's just going to, you know, fuck everything up because no one's going to be able to get their hands on it. And, you know, they'll think that, oh, you know, it's this and this and that. But, yeah, I mean, I, I, I use an injectable Anadrol myself. Growth hormone. Do you use growth hormone and insulin? Um, no insulin, but I am using four and a half. I use a serostim, and um, you know, I mean, the, the thing is, is you know, most bodybuilders, when you ask their dosage of growth, it's basically what they can afford. You know, it's <laughs> if they can afford thirty IU's, they're taking thirty IU's. You know, it depends on their bank account. So, I mean, obviously, I can afford to take you know thirty IU's. But, you know, four and a half, I believe, is the most growth you should take, you know, to, to get the least amount of side effects. I, I don't think, you know, I think going over, and the reason I say four and a half, obviously, is because the Cero stems, you know, that he, that's exactly a fourth of the bottle. But um, I, I don't, I, I, you know, I believe growth hormone is a huge reason for the descended stomachs and... You know, I think four and a half I use is about as high as you need to go before you start having, you know, side effects. Right. Now, do you feel that the uh, the generic and Chinese growth hormones out there are not as effective as the pharmaceutical uh, GH that's out there? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, I would tell people not to waste their time or money or energy on, on the Chinese because some of it's good, some of it's not. You really don't know what you're getting. And most of the time they come out with a product that is good for, you know, a couple months and then, you know, then it becomes, you know, then they do the big switcheroo, you know, and it's useless and you don't know when that's going to happen. And, uh, and then plus, you know, having it shipped, you know, I've known people that have gotten in trouble, you know, by having it shipped to their house and, you know, it's just, it's really not worth it, you know? And so I tell people, you know, just if they can, you know, just stick to the American or don't take it at all. That's my opinion. Let me ask you this question, and I, I, and I have to ask you this because um, I've put it out there already. Um, you know, I'm in my 40s, late 40s now. You're in your 40s. Um, do you worry about health? And I know, look, I go for blood work. You go for blood work. We check our blood pressure. But let's face it, you know, anabolic steroids and being that big definitely puts a strain on our systems, on our heart, on our kidneys, even if we do get health checks and everything like that. Um, I opted, obviously, to downsize myself just because – it didn't. I didn't. It had no function for me to be that big. Obviously, you're making money from being a big freak right now. Does it concern you that maybe the size that you're carrying around at your age might be taking years off your life long term? Oh uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm definitely well aware of that, and I'm definitely um, concerned. And you know, I, I'm, I'm blowing up. You know, and what I'm doing isn't isn't the wisest choice in the world. Um, but it's something I feel like I, I just need to do and I want to do. And um, um, I'm going to, after this, I'm going to go back to my, you know, my weight I enjoy being at, which is 260. And probably, you know, the year 2017, you know, I'll probably start downsizing. And I think I could be very comfortable at, you know, 220 and, you know, still have a great physique and, you know, be happy with the way I look. And, you know, um, it's, you know, it's, it's crazy because, you know, it's, it's, this is what I do now, you know, it's, uh, this is my business. And, uh, for all those years, it wasn't my business, you know, when I was, you know, killing myself to be as big as possible, you know, and now, now, you know, it became my business when I kind of was getting out of the sport, you know, when, when I met mutant, I was 260 pounds and, you know, I was, I was in really good shape, but I definitely was not at all like a bodybuilder. You know, I definitely, you know, wasn't trying and didn't have the look of a bodybuilder, um, you know, so, uh, so it's, it's crazy because now, you know, now I'm, I'm making a career out of, you know, in the bodybuilding industry. Now, Rich, you've always been a guy now, that I, you're a guy that I 
believe has a true strong mental mindset like you said when you put your mind to being your best bodybuilder you were going to be there was no holds barred um you know do you think that today's generation of bodybuilders are weaker mentally than they were back maybe in the 90s and, and early 2000s uh, it sounds like there's a lot of complainers out there a lot of people that i don't see training as hard um what do you attribute that to um i i definitely yeah i mean by the sports change but I think even more so that, you know, it was in in the 70s and 80s, you know, I think is when people, you know, were really putting a lot into, you know, they would train three, four hours a day. You know, it was, I think it was more about the work ethic back in the 70s and 80s. And I think from there, it gradually, slowly became less and less. And I think, um, I mean, my personal opinion, um, I mean, I don't want to title ever try to talk negative about anyone or put anything negative out there about any specific people. But I think um, Dorian, Ye Dorian Yates, um, the way he trained and, you know, the methods that he put out there, I think, I think it really had a big impact on changing the bodybuilding world forever. You know, and I, I think that, you know, you think about like Arnold's beliefs and how he trained, you know, he, he, you know, he trained three, four hours a day, you know, and, um, he believed that, you know, that's what it took, you know, six days a week. And, and uh, you know, Dorian Yates, you know, was more kind of like, you know, Mike Mincer, you know, philosophy and about, you know, less time in the gym is better. And, um, you know, I think that is what really, really, really changed the bodybuilding world. And, you know, people spent a lot less time in the gym. Um, people, you know, didn't do as much cardio. And I think that, I honestly think that's what really, you know, changed bodybuilding a lot was, uh, you know, because, you know, he was the best in the world, you know, and, you know, when he, I remember when those black and white pictures came out in Flex, you know, people lost their fucking minds, you know, so, you know, whatever he said, you know, people did, you know, it was like, you know, he's, he was the fucking man, you know, at that time. So, you know, when he came out and gave that information, you know, I, I think we all, you know, want to find the easier way. So if the top guy is telling us we only need to train three or four days a week for 45 minutes, you know, it's like, fuck, all right, that sounds awesome. You know, rather than training three or four hours a day, six days a week, you know, and so I, I think that's really what changed it, you know, and I, I, I know that, you know, in recent years, it's, you know, it's, you know, C.T. Fletcher, Mike Rashid, myself, Cali Muscle, I mean, we've all basically said there's no such thing as overtraining, you know, you get what you put in. And, you know, we we have constantly, you know, been talk talking about, you know, more, 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 you know. And um, so I, I think, you know, we've slowly started to change it back to how it used to be. Um, and I think it is going back in that direction, you know. And the truth is in life, you know, you get what you put in, you know, the more you put into anything, the more you're going to get out. And that goes for everything. And, and for whatever reason, bodybuilding, you know, it got to that point where, you know, it was believed that, you know, you, you can't do too, you know, you can do too much. You know, you, you careful, you're going to overtrain. You know, you, you work out for 45 minutes or an hour and you got to get out of the gym. You know, and it, it's just, in my opinion, it's just not true. You know, it's the more you put into anything, the more you're going to get out. You know, and it's, 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 it's great to think that, you know, you can do less and get more, but, you know, that's not ever going to be the case, you know, no matter what you do in life, you know, it's, it's going to be hard work, period. Well, I, I think also you have to figure out what kind of physique you have. You can't, there's not a, a one size fits all, uh, I guess you could say, uh, protocol that fits everyone. Some people overtrain easily and they can't train as much. And then some people need to train more because they have that kind of a physique. So I think you kind of have to assess who you are to get. I think the problem with bodybuilding has always been in extremes. Either don't train too much, you know, do two sets or do a hundred million sets. And I think we, we, once again, we have to find balance. And as bodybuilders, we do have problems finding that balance. And everyone's balance is different because everyone's metabolism is different. Um, you know, Rich, you have a new product coming out with your 5% nutrition line called uh, Mentality. Now, we were just speaking about mindset. What is Mentality meant to do, and what will people experience when they use this product? Um, you know, real quick, um, on my products, I, um, what, I, what I like to do is I like to, I like to come out with products that I believe are, are different than what's out there. You know, and that's, that's my main goal. 
is trying to come out with, with different things. And um, it's very difficult because, you know, the supplement industry has been around for, what, 40 years? So, you know, it's, it's difficult to come out with new products. And um, it's, it's the first product. One of my first products I came out with was, you know, All Day You May. And to me, the theory behind that product was genius because it was about feeding the body 24 hours a day, right? So my theory was instead of feeding the body every two to three hours, let's feed the body, you know, all day long, you know, just keep those BCAs, you know, in the system 24 hours a day and, you know, the digestive enzymes going so you can digest the food, you know, when you eat. And, you know, another, another idea I always had was, you know, the supplement companies for carbs, they would always put maltodextrin, dextrose. So I always had the idea of, you know, why not, you know, yams, sweet potatoes, you know, why not put, you know, real food, real good carbs in these products? You know, it never made sense to me why companies never did that. And, you know, when I decided to do it for my own company, I realized that there's no profit margin. And that's why companies don't do it, that I'm really not making any money, you know, on that product, real food, but it was something I had to do. So, I mean, sorry to kind of go in a different direction here, but the, the mentality is also a product that I think is a little bit different. You know, although other companies have done similar products, so forth, but it's, it's more about focus. And the truth be told is I, I used Adderall, you know, quite often. Adderall was something that I, you know, used on a, on a you know, not a regular basis, but quite often. And uh, for me, it was amazing. You know, if I had, you know, a business meeting or I wanted to brainstorm, you know, it, it, it did things with my brain that were just unexplainable. You know, words would kind of my, come out of my mouth that I've never used in my life. And I was just intrigued. And so, you know, I talked to the chemist that works, you know, works for me. And also the guy that owns, you know, the company that makes my products. And I said, look, guys, you know, this is basically what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a natural version of Adderall. You know, is that a possibility? Is that, you know, they said, well, anything's a possibility, you know, so they, 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 they put their heads together and, you know, they, they would do samples, come up with different things and I would try it. Other people would try it. And, you know, that, that's where that product came from is, uh, you know, is, is, is a natural version of Adderall and it's about focus and it, it really doesn't have much, it, it does you know, give you energy, but it's, it's really not for that. It's not a pre-workout. It's not anything close to that. It's more, you know, just taking the focus part out of Adderall and, um, you know, turning that into a supplement. And that's, that's, that's basically what we did. And, um, you know, it, 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 it works amazing. And, um, you know, that's what I'm trying to do is bring different things to the supplement industry that haven't been done. And not only that different theories and, you know, I'm, I'm working on, I can only do so much. That's the problem is I only have like eight products and I could have 80 products right now, you know, easily and be making 80 times the amount of money I'm making if I was to just come out with everything, you know, and that's basically what companies do. You know, they, they you start a company and you just come out with all the products and you market them, you know, and if your marketing is better than this company's marketing, then you're going to outsell them. You know, if you have better athletes to represent your company, you're going to make more money, you know, and that's really how the industry works is, you know, it's about having as many products as you can, having the best marketing, the best people representing your products, and you're going to have the biggest company, you know, and make the most profit. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of doing things differently and there's a lot of products I refuse to do, you know, which is, you know, growth hormone releasers or, you know, fake steroids, you know, testosterone boosters. I, I don't believe in those. And I don't believe there ever will be, you know, it's either you take steroids or you don't take steroids. That's it. There is no in between. You know, you make a decision. Are you going to take steroids or you're not going to take steroids? If you're not, then just fucking eat a healthy diet, take the supplements necessary to go along with that diet and be a natural bodybuilder, period. You know, or take the steroids. And so, that, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, I, the people that are involved in my company fought with me, you know, like daily because the profit margin is so insane on those kinds of products. And, you know, 
basically all I'm, I'm known mostly for talking openly about steroids. So the funny thing is if I was to come out with a product that was, you know, my rich pianos, you know, new, you know, natural steroid, you know, I'd make fucking millions of dollars, obviously, because, you know, that's what I'm known for is steroids. So it would be an easy, an easy thing for me to come out with, you know, a steroid, natural steroid product and make millions of dollars. But in doing so, you know, I'd be doing something that, that I'm totally against. And in my opinion, I'd be lying, lying to everyone, misleading everyone. And, you know, just, you know, I would ruin my name. So, uh, you know, so that's, that's one thing I'm, I'm very concerned about is, is doing what's right, you know, and when I first came out with the supplement company, you know, my first marketing video, I came out and I said, take the protein powders, throw them in the garbage, take the weight gainers and throw them in the garbage. This shit is garbage, you know, and people were like, what the fuck? What is this guy? This guy's lost his fucking mind. What's he talking about? You know, shit. Three weeks ago, he was telling us to fucking take eight scoops of mutant weight gainer. Now he's telling us it's garbage, you know? And, you know, the thing was is, you know, I just came out and I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to fucking tell everyone the truth. I'm just going to be honest and I'm going to tell everyone the truth, you know? And the truth is, is, you know, weight gainers, in my opinion, are garbage. You know, I mean, you can simply take, you know, egg whites, oatmeal, and a banana and make a fucking incredible shape to put on weight just by using food you get at the grocery store, you know, and you have no chemicals, no garbage, you know, it's, it's a no brainer. Um, you know, but the funny thing is, is, you know, you have to come out and tell people this. They, they can't come up with this on their own. You know, they can't logically realize that, okay, you know, I'm buying fats and sugars and maltodextrin and, you know, I'm buying all this stuff and I can simply just throw some oatmeal and some egg whites in a blender and, you know, what's the better scenario? And, um, you know, so that, that was, you know, my main reasoning for starting a supplement line is, is getting the truth out to the younger generation. Because when I was 16 years old, I basically lived off the of Gainers Fuel 1000. And uh, I'm sure you remember that product. Yeah, right? oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, that was the biggest thing, you know, Twin Lab was the shit. And those, you know, it was funny because every month, they came out with a bigger, you know, first it was Gators Fuel 500, and then it was Gators Fuel 600, Gators Fuel, and I think it went all the way up to Gators Fuel like 2,000. <laughs> and, you know, you had to buy the 2,000, you know, and all it was was, you know, more sugar and more maltodextrin. And I honestly would drink five of those shakes a day, and I would eat one or two food meals. And I honestly, I swear to God, I believe that that was the best scenario for me to put on pure muscle and to become a top bodybuilder. And I was doing that for years thinking that that was the right thing to do, you know? And it was like, holy shit, I wasted two years. Instead of drinking five shakes and having two meals, I could have been eating seven solid meals, you know, and I probably would have put on, you know, 60 pounds of muscle during those two years. Rich, let me so ask you a question. Um, you mentioned 16 year olds. If a 16 year old came up to you today and said, I want to do a steroid cycle, what do you recommend? What would you tell them? Uh, you know what? That happens all the time. And I tell them that, you know, stay the fuck away from steroids. You know, um, the truth is, is, is that there's no reason in the world anyone should take steroids, you know, under the age of 25. That just makes no sense. Your testosterone levels are at their peak. You're going to get the most results you'll ever get in your life at that time, natural. And, you know, all you're doing is you're taking an incredible thing you have in your body and you're ruining it, you know, you're, you're going to shut down your testosterone levels and your testosterone levels at that time are at their, at their highest, you know, so that, that's, that would, that's the stupidest thing you could do. Now, if you're set on becoming a pro bodybuilder and you're set on making this a career and making it a living, you know, well, then that's something you're going to have to do. You know, I mean, if, if, if that's your choice, I mean, most people, if they decide they're going to be a pro bodybuilder at 17, they're not going to wait till they're 25, you know, to get on a cycle, um, you know, times just passing them by, but it's definitely, I'm totally against, you know, uh, younger, younger kids like that taking steroids. It's, it makes no sense. And another thing that I might add is that this is what I believe. And I believe that 
whatever you build naturally is truly you. You know, it, it's real. So if you were to get up to 220 pounds naturally before you took steroids, uh, and then let's say you blow up to 280 for 15 years, I believe that that 220, you know, is where you're going to go back down to. And I think that someone that starts taking steroids at, you know, 16 years old or 17 years old and they weigh 170 pounds that and they get to 280, that that 170 to 280 is all false. And when they eventually stop taking steroids, they're going to go all the way back down to 170 because all that weight was all fake. It was all put on by steroids. I mean, this is, I know people are going to think this is crazy coming from, from me, you know, because most guys that take steroids would argue the point, you know, but my opinion is that it's very, very important to build that nice foundation naturally. Get as big as you can naturally. And, you know, that is your true foundation. And, you know, that's where you're going to stay. So the day comes that you stop taking steroids, you know, I believe that you're not going to dip down below that 220. You know, that 220 is really you. So that's my advice to people is, you know, get as big as you can naturally before you jump on the steroids. And, you know, I, I did not do that. You know, I started taking them at 18 and, you know, I was around 190 pounds and, you know, I blew up to 230, you know, in, in, in less than a year. And, you know, at that age, you know, I, I much would have been better off, you know, staying off the steroids and waiting until I was, you know, in my 20s. Um, but, you know, I was obsessed with being a bodybuilder. You know, I was, I was going to turn pro. I was going to be on the Olympia stage. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have one day to waste, you know, so I, I, I jumped on. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was, it's funny because when I was 16 and 17, I was against steroids. And um, I told myself I would never take them. And, you know, after competing naturally in six contests, I realized that it was something I was going to have to do. You know, there was no way around it if I was going to continue on the road, you know, being a bodybuilder. So, you know, I, that's when I decided it's, it's what am I going to do? And, you know, I chose steroids. Last question uh, for the night. Uh, I know we've had you here a while. Uh, is bodybuilding dying, getting worse, or is bodybuilding still growing, in your opinion, the sport? I think bodybuilding is growing. And I, I, I know a lot of people, you know, aren't really in the bodybuilders aren't really, you know, they, they don't care for the bikini. They don't care for the men's physique. And my opinion is I think that that has helped the sport. And I think having all these, these people getting involved in bikini and men's physique has helped the sport grow. And it's not necessarily bodybuilding has grown. It's just the entire fitness industry is just huge. You know, it's just grow. It grows so much each year and it makes it seem like bodybuilding is dying because everything else is growing so big but i really believe that that bodybuilding is is going to start making a comeback and it's going to start getting even bigger and um that's a lot of the reason of me doing this series that i'm doing is i think that a lot of guys out there want to be bodybuilders but they think that it's it's just impossible or it's too difficult and therefore, they're, they're sticking to, to men's physique, you know, and they can, you know, within a year or two, they can hop on stage and win a trophy, you know, and they can compete and, you know, be involved in the industry and be a competitor, you know, and on their Instagram, they can put, you know, NPC competitor, you know, national level competitor, which I think is a, makes a lot of people feel good about themselves to be able to, you know, say that and so forth. But I think me doing these videos I think people are going to see that it really isn't as difficult as it seems. And, you know, within a year or two, people can put on a substantial amount of muscle and be competing as a bodybuilder. And I honestly think, I mean, it's amazing how many people are following this program. I mean, there is, I don't know if you've seen the views, but at the LA Expo, I'm saying, I'm going to tell you hundreds and hundreds of people all came up to me and they're all doing the program and they're all getting great results. And, you know, I really think that this series is going to help immensely in, in help bodybuilding come back and, you know, get people back to, you know, wanting to be big and, you know, getting it, you know, it seems like it, it's, it, it, I don't think it's died as much as a sport, but I think that there's not as many bodybuilders around, you know, like back in the nineties, you walk in a gym and there was big guys everywhere. 
not necessarily competitors, just guys that want to be big. And nowadays you walk in a gym and you really don't see big guys, you know, anywhere. So I think, as you say, as a sport died, I don't necessarily think the sport has so much died, but I think just the popularity of people wanting to be big has died definitely. And uh, People could check out, you know, all this stuff you're talking about on your very, very popular YouTube page. I mean, I, I when I look at the views on these videos, Rich, I am flabbergasted how many views you get on these videos. I'm just blown away because it's obviously people not just in our industry but all over that are watching these videos um wh what do you think about these people like uh louis marco and vegan gains and some of these like you know internet uh youtube sensationalists who like to bash you and 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 i'm sure they do that so they can get views on their videos do you care about these people do you ever respond to them at all um you know i don't i mean so sometimes i i say things in a generalization and you know, it's to me, it, it makes no sense to be negative. You know, I, I don't understand, you know, the negativity. You know, it, I think that people should try to be positive. And, you know, a, a good example is if I'm in the gym training with a, with a guy and we see a guy across the gym, and let's say the guy has an incredible upper body, like just amazing, and he has weak calves. And I say to my buddy, and I say, holy shit, look at that guy's fucking upper body, man. It's fucking flawless. You know, I can guarantee you, my buddy's going to look over and say, yeah, but look at his calves. He has no calves, you know. What a fucking idiot. You know, why would you want to have a big upper body? With and that's that's honestly the mentality of most people nowadays, you know, is that, you know, you either, the glass is half full or half empty. And when you look at someone, you know, there's just as much positive as, as, as there is negative. So when I look at anybody, you know, any YouTuber, any, you know, there's just as much positive and negative, And I don't understand why... We don't look for the positive, you know, why not point out the positive, you know, but, you know, it seems like most people's mentality is they just, they, they want to find the negative in everything, you know, and it's sad, you know, and, and it's like, I mean, even good friends of mine, you know, good people that I know, you know, it's like, I'll, I'll be in the gym and that same scenario will happen. And every fucking time, it's got to be something negative, you know, and that's how it is on YouTube. That's how it's on Instagram, on Facebook. It's like you post a picture and people, their brain is programmed to try to find something negative. And as soon as they find it, then they have to go write it, you know, and it's, it, it makes no sense. And, you know, I've learned throughout the years, you know, to, to look for the positive and, you know, there's positive in everybody, you know, and these, these individuals that you mentioned, you know, I can find positive in those guys. And if you ask me what I think about them, you know, I, there's negative and there's positive but I can choose which way I want to go, you know? And I just wish that other people could see things that way and, um, you know, the world would be a better place, you know? And the sad thing is, is that um, not only are people talking the negative and, and talking shit and causing drama, but other people like that. Other people are entertained. Other people want the drama. They want the negativity. So, you know, if people are getting views doing what they do, then, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's what other people are into also, you know, so the negative works, you know, talking shit, you know, works because other people, you know, want to hear it also, you know, so I personally don't want to hear it, you know, like if I go watch a YouTube video, I want to be motivated. I want to, I want to leave, you know, that video, you know, feeling good, you know, in a good mood, feeling uplifted, you know, and, uh, you know, that's that's what I try to make my videos. I try to make them motivating and educational and, you know, people put people in the right state of mind. Well, you know, I, I can relate to it because, you know, when I was coming up and wanted to be a bodybuilder and I would look at pictures of Sylvester Stallone and watch the movies and I'm like, that's what I want to look like. And people would say, what about Arnold Schwarzenegger? I'm like, oh, he's too big. I don't want to look like that. But the, the, the truth of the matter was in my mind, I couldn't see myself being that big. So I was looking for an, a, a way to poo-poo how he looked to make myself feel better about the way I looked. And I think that's what a lot of other people do. They see things and they maybe they're jealous of your success, the money you make, 
the amount of muscle you pack, your physique, your personality. Some people want to put it down. That, I mean, that's that's human nature, I think. But, uh, Rich, I want to thank you for uh, taking a lot of time out of your schedule and talking to us tonight. I know you're going to have a stupendous, spectacular booth, as you always do, at the upcoming Arnold Classic uh, in Columbus, Ohio. I'm sure there'll be a ton of fans that are going to stop by, and I'm sure you'll be doing some spectacular stuff there. Um, please keep us updated on any new stuff you got coming out. And uh, like I said, we, we love when you come on rxmuscle.com, and we appreciate you taking the time. Awesome. Are you guys going to be there? Of course. Of course. Well, stop by the booth. God we damn will. It. <laughs> you can give me some mentality. You can keep me awake all weekend. <laughs> right on. All right. Thanks for the talk, Dave. I had a good time as always, and uh, I, you know, I love uh, doing interviews with you. So uh, I'll see you at the Arnold. Stop by the booth, and we'll uh, we'll we'll catch up. Absolutely. All right, and that will take us to the end of another episode of Live with. I'm your host, Dave Palumbo, and I want to thank SciTech Nutrition for sponsoring all our coverage of all the Arnold Classics coming up over the next uh, two months. I want to thank Rich Piana for stopping by, and for now, we'll see you next time.